Now, if you turn your Bibles with me to the book of James, tonight I want to talk to you about prayers that avail much. Now, how many remember back in January the way it was or the way you were in January? How many remember the way you were in January? Anyone? Were you on fire? How many fasted and prayed in January? How many were on fire for God? Is it still the same? Please, sorry, help me. Is it still the same? What happened? What happened to us from January? What went wrong or what has stopped us from the way we were? Mark chapter 4 explains it to you. And from verse 14, it speaks about when the soul sows the word, where some fall on stony ground, uh, some the devil catches away immediately, some fall on stony ground, and it talks about those where the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches entering in and choke the word. The reason we were the way we were in January is because we were focused. How many remember you were focused? We were focused. We know what we wanted and we went for God with everything we had. Then after a while, things happen, things, bills come up, circumstances come in, things don't go as they're supposed to. And after a while, we begin to, you know, when things go wrong, we stop praying. When things go wrong, we stop reading and not realizing that is the very essence of why things go wrong. So it's supposed to distract us from pursuing the presence of God. Now, when we talk about prayer and we go to James chapter 5, verse 16, when James says we should confess our faults one to another and pray for one another, um, he says that you may be healed um, when, you, when you confess your sins, it closes the door to the devil and it allows the Spirit of God to come into our lives. Then it says, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. How many righteous people do we have in here? You know you are. Every hand should be up because you know he's made, he was made to be seen who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So if you're born again, you've been made the righteousness of God. Righteousness means right standing. So we have right standing before God. And he says we should come boldly to the throne of grace where we may obtain mercy and find grace and help in the time of need. So if we, if we know we have right standing, we know we can come to the throne boldly. If you have a sin consciousness, you'll always be going cowering before God because you're always conscious of what you've done wrong. When you know you're righteous before God, not our righteousness, because the Bible says our own righteousness is as filthy rags, but we are not righteous in our own righteousness. We are righteous through the blood of Jesus Christ who paid this price for sin, and now he's made us to be, he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So when you pray, you're, you're a righteous person, and he says the prayer of, of uh, the 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 prayer, effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Now, when we pray, we must understand, and one of the subtle things I think the devil uses, when you go back to the book of Genesis, and you think to yourself, how did he talk Eve into biting into that fruit? How did Adam stand there and allow his wife to bite that fruit that changed destiny for eternity? How did he do that? And you think to yourself, we know, we know, I think we all know the importance of prayer. I think all of us in here must understand to some level that nothing changes without prayer. I think all of us in here must know, many of us, it's a grandmother or somebody that stood in the gap for us and prayed so that the blind is removed from our mind and the glorious light, the gospel, is able to shine into our hearts. So why is it when we, get, when we get saved, like if we said there's a barbecue on Sunday, the whole church will turn up with their family? Because it's food. But when we say prayer meeting, it's, it's amazing how many people have been deceived, deceived into thinking, making a living is more important than living for God. And we, we orchestrate God around our lifestyle. God has to fit into our lifestyle where years ago, it was our lifestyle had to learn to fit into God because God was number one. We, people got up and people 
willfully got up early to pray. And, and the, let me tell you, if you find prayer tedious, it's because you don't have a revelation of the power that's available to you. I don't know about Monday night, was a, I'd say for a long time, it was a wonderful prayer meeting. When I, when I stood in the corner wherever I was over there and prayed, it just felt so light and easy to pray. Now, some of you probably didn't know this because prayer is just prayer to you. But you know when, you, when you're warring in the spirit, there's sometimes you come up against strongholds. And, and there's strongholds. That's when you, you got, sometimes you're praying and it's like going uphill. Uh, not everyone can identify. So, but for those of us who have, you know there's, there's levels when you've got to contend with the kingdom of darkness. And when you break through, it's like this glorious freedom in the spirit realm where it's like pray. You can just pray for hours. There's no, no, there's no, uh, no hindrances to your pr- That's what it was like on Monday night. Now, this is, this is what's interesting to me. Today's Christian is not asking, please teach me to pray. Today's Christian think they can just get saved, do what they want. Funny, Jesus, Jesus' disciples in Luke chapter 11, they said to Jesus, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples to pray. Lesson number one, prayer is taught. Prayer is taught. There are a lot of people praying and they don't know what they're doing. Prayer, Jesus' disciples after seeing, and the interesting thing is, they were with him for so long. And they saw him going into the mountains. Jesus was always in the mountain, always in prayer. But his disciples looked at him and says, Lord, teach us to pray. They saw something about him that they weren't doing. And they said to him, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples to pray. In other words, this was something that the leaders are supposed to do. But you can't teach unwilling people. You get that? So it's only people who are saying, I want to learn to pray. And listen to me, church, you better understand that prayer is one of your most powerful weapons. And as a Christian, you're at war. Now, you know what? You could say, well, I'm not at war with nobody. Have you been born again? You're in the army. And in this army, there's not a world war. There is a universal war. There's a war not for land, but there's a law, there's a war for souls. And there is the kingdom of darkness who, if the saints do nothing, will win the victory. The reason why this country has become a non-Christian nation, and you can't say it's a Christian nation anymore because we're far from being a Christian nation. <clears throat> the moment you are able to ban Bibles from school, The moment you're able to ban Christians witnessing to people, think about it, how will they hear except the preacher preaches? Now, if the preacher is banned from preaching, if you muzzle the preacher, that means there's no salvation being taught. So what we do is we take, when they pass a law, because we don't pray, we go outside the House of Parliament with wooden boards saying, bring prayer back into school. That doesn't move anybody. Do you remember when Tony Blair, they, they, a million people went onto the streets of London and demonstrated against Tony Blair going to war against Iraq? And it made no difference. They all still went home and the army went to war. Let me tell you, church, there's some things you cannot deal with in the natural. Sometimes if a million people had got together and prayed and asked God to remove him from power, there would have been no war. But what we do, we stand back and we want to do things in the natural. And let me show you something here. Um, in, in the book of Ephesians, it says this. Chapter 6. Number one, you must know your enemy. A lot of us don't understand. How many before you go to bed at night you pray? How many have ever experienced spiritual attacks? You did? 
I went home after Monday's prayer meeting. It was so wonderful. I felt so good. And about one o'clock in the morning, I felt something like grab me. You know that thing that happens to you? And you can't talk and I'll oh, box you. Come out, get out of here. And you know you got that experience and you just bind it, you cast it out. But usually when you're doing something for God, that's when the devil wants to attack you. And I felt like Monday night's prayer meeting was such unified. It was so unified that I knew that something was going to come. There's always a counterattack to stop with your breakthrough. Now look at the book of Ephesians. You must understand this. You have to understand what takes place spiritually. Now here it says, Finally, my brethren, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, it says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of whose might? This is not a war we fight with our own strength. You have to learn to depend on God. It says, put on the whole armor of God, which is another message in itself, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. What are the wiles of the devil? You read that. How many of you ever stopped and asked, what is that? Anybody? You just read and go past it? Is that what you do? What did I tell you? Study to show yourself, approve unto God. You know when you study, you don't forget things. So he says, we should wear the whole arm of God that we may be able to stand against the wiles of or the strategies of the devil. What are his strategies and why should we wear the armor? Let me show you some of the strategies, strategies he'll bring to your life. Number one, you could experience frustration. Have you ever been in a place where you're pushing and pushing, but you can't break through? Have you ever been in a place where you've done everything, prayed every prayer, and yet nothing changes? Speak to me and I'll tell you what to do. Have you ever been in that place? Well, he told you what to do. What did he tell you to do? Having done all to stand, stand therefore. That means when I've done everything I know, know to do, I've done all I can do in the natural. When I've come to the end of myself, then God kicks in with the supernatural. Like, so when I'm feeling sick and I've done all I know to do, I stand on the word. When I've lived for God and I'm a single woman and I've done all I know to do, I've kept myself for God and I've, I'm not hunting for any man. I'm looking for Jesus. Having done all to stand, I'll stand trusting and believe that God Almighty will bring the right person into my life. So frustration. Another thing which is major to most people is discouragement. Discouragement is one of the strategies. Strategies is one of those fiery darts that hits you from blind side. You're doing well. Have you ever had a great victory and then the next day is the most depressing day? Have you noticed that? You think you're the only, bot, only person? Let me tell you, he can't stop you getting victory, but he will have his best shot as trying to stop you enjoying the victory. So we, you recognize discouragement. Discouragement comes to everybody. It knocks on all of our door. It's just some of us don't open the door. Some of us open the door and invite it in for a cup of tea. Every one of us has the opportunity to be discouraged. I don't care who you are. If you think that as a Christian, every day is going to be a great day, you are wrong. Because there are days where it does not seem like everything is going according to plan, but you cannot be moved by what you see, you cannot be moved by what you feel, or what your circumstances appear like. Your, 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 your standard or your, your foundation is God's word. God's promises are yea and they are amen. So if, whether I feel discouraged or not, listen to me, discouragement is a state of your emotion. It is when you look at what is rather than what could be. Sometimes if you look at the way you are, how many of you know you could become discouraged? Anybody? You look around and all, you know, this country has some nice cars. Haven't they got some nice cars? And you drive, you're still pushing yours. And you see, everybody else with a new car, sometimes, if you're not careful, you could say, God, what's wrong with me? 
But you must recognize everybody has their day. Everyone has their day. So discouragement is not based, my life is not, my joy is not based on circumstance. My joy is based on the indwelling of the Christ in me. And I choose every day, I make a decision to every day have a good day. Some people get discouraged because it's raining. Thank God you're alive to feel the rain. You say, but I don't have a car, but you have legs. But my legs get tired. Thank God you have shoes on them. See, what is the glass half full or half empty? Did you get it? Is my glass half full or half empty? Sorry? <laughs> Isn't it, doesn't it depend on the way we look at it? Is it three quarters full or a quarter empty? Huh? The newscaster says it's 10% chance of rain. Well, what about the 90% chance of sunshine? Is it the way you look at it? And we listen to that. Instead of having the barbecue, we said, no, it's going to rain because they said 10% chance of rain. Well, what about the 90% chance of sunshine? Isn't it the way you look at life? When you say, but I don't have enough money, but you have your health. I don't have a house, to, my own house, but you have a roof over your head. I, I, I don't have, I saw mansions, but I don't have a room. But you do have your, your, your health, your legs, your arms, your eyes, your, your breath, your, your, you have everything. Isn't it the way we look at life? Amen. Next thing is confusion. There's a lot of confused people. No wonder they create that thing called confused.com. Because there, there is a lot of confused people. Some people don't know whether they're male or female. Some people don't know whether they're supposed to be happily married or miserable. Some people don't know whether they're Christian or, or a sinner. Confused people. I don't know. How I many know at some stage in your Christian walk, you will be asking yourself, am I really saved? Has anyone been there? You ever been in a place where like, am I really saved? Right? So are you saved? Yes. Are you saved based on your feeling? No. So you're not confused about anything. How many know you're a woman if you're a woman? Yes. Say amen. amen. How many men, I want to hear all men's voices now, no women's voices coming out of this one. How many men know they're men? Yes. Thank God I didn't know they say, I'm not sure. <laughs> so... Here's another one. Another fiery dart comes at you. Doctrinal error. Some of you like to move. You, 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 talk, you took that scripture in John chapter 3 when Jesus says, except a man be born again. And he talks about the spirit. Um, what's it say again? Let me read it for you. I can't remember what it says there. Who's got John chapter 3? Look what it says. Are you there? It says, the spirit lists list, list it where it will. So, uh, 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 don't worry about the verse. I, I, I can't remember where it is now. <laughs> so, beat you up when I get home. But watch this. So, so what we have is, is a lot of Christians who think they can move where they want. Do what you want. Go where you want. When you want. Listen, do you know when you're born again, you belong to Christ? Do you know, we, we don't have the right to choose what we want. You say, show me a scripture. Well, I will. Yes, verse 8. Thank you, Alicia. You can have dinner with us. <laughs> now, when we are born again, we are bought with a price. The clothes we own. Do you know, in the days of slavery, when the slave master owned a slave, everything the slave owned was his. Every child born into that household 
became the masters. When we were bought with the price, everything we own belongs to God. We are to trust in the Lord with all our hearts. We're supposed to acknowledge him in all of our ways. We're supposed to say, God, what would you have me do? And this thing with doctrinal errors, there's so much doctrine out there. You flick on one station and it's like, oh my gosh. And you flick on another, oh my gosh. You flick on another one, oh my gosh. And then you're like, what is the truth? Because most Christians today don't stay anywhere long enough to become rooted and grounded. And they say, if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. And this thing with moving around from church to church, you have never, ever, 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 ever in nearly 30 years in ministry ever seen one person that moves from church to church that has ever been rooted, grounded, and growing. Never. The ones I've ever seen that has, that has grown, that has been promoted, are those who stayed under one roof and grew and grew and served. You can't just, some of you just come to church. You are doing, it's like I saw a, a woman talking about this the other day. Uh, she was saying, most people are asking, how little do I have to do to get into heaven? Or how much can I get away with and still get to heaven. And we've got to get to the place where we are completely sold out to Jesus. I mean, completely, 100% sold out to Christ. What's another one here? Worry. How many have ever worried? Come on. Shame the devil. How many have ever worried? How many has it ever changed your circumstance? How many worried several times? How many worried many times? Come on, answer me now. How many worried many times? How many worried more than 10? Shout amen. amen. More than 20. Amen. Say amen louder. More than 50. Amen. More than 100 times. Amen. Then when do we get it? It doesn't work. It really doesn't work. We do it. We lay on our bed. God, what am I going to do? And then you know what? Somehow we get through it. We always get through it. Stress. These are all darts of the wicked one to stop you praying. Distractions. You watch people coming to church doing really good, on fire for God. Let me tell you, Satan, this, we're going to go back to the prayer, right? But I'm going to explain something to you now. He knows what your weakness is, and he knows how to apply it. Some of you girls, you're in church and you're doing really good. And all of a sudden, you see, when you, whatever you do, it has to be on the right foundation. Because when you come with the wrong foundation, you're, only, you're in church and you're doing really good, and all of a sudden, there's a guy in the church. And this guy smiles at you, and you, you look back. You know, it's like... <laughs> at that moment, you're on a downward slide. If a man... Let me tell you, there's this thing where the devil uses on women called biological clock. Your biological clock is ticking. Well, how comes Sarah's biological clock went into reverse? How, how is it that God is able to reverse the circumstance and without giving too much detail, a 90-year-old woman gives birth to a child? So if Jesus is the same yesterday, today... And forevermore. And on top of that, you've got to get to this place to stop worry dominating you. You've got to get to the place where you let everything go. And you've even got to get let go a marriage. And say, well, God, you know what? This is when you make decisions like this. The devil loses power over you. When you say, if I remain single, then I'll remain single. See, then he's not going to torment you. But when you keep going around, today, God, today, this is my day, today. Shanda Rebo Momosa. I'm going to walk the streets today. And Mr. Wright, my, what do you all call him? My Boaz is coming down the street. And you're walking. Your Boaz is coming. See, when you live like that, you're always going to be depressed. Because it is better to be single and happy serving Jesus. Because when you go into 1 Corinthians 7, it, talks to, it tells you about when a woman is single, her focus is God. 
When you get married, your focus is husband, children, house, cooking, cleaning. It distracts you. And whilst you're running around, single isn't all that bad. Because you are some of the married people in here, they would swap like that. If they could exchange with you, they'll like that. And you'll be the one saying, it's, it's like, it's like the, the people who don't have a license, they always want to drive. Dom, when Dom, when Dom was learning to drive, me and him would go for seven to eight hours, driving from Northampton all the way down to Croydon. We drive, we drive. And this is him. I said, you tired? He said, no, no. Don't you want me to drive? No, no. He's, he's relaxed. He's loving it. Get his license. Dom, can you go to the petrol station and get me some milk? Oh, no, no, Dad, I'm tired. <laughs> so it's like, when you have, don't have your license, you want something. Every minute, it's like, if his mother just says, is there any butter? He says, I'll, I'll go, I'll take you, I'll take you. Because he didn't have his license. And some of you single women are like that. When you ain't got your license, it's like, I'm talking about marriage. When you get your license, it's, oh, Jesus, my head, my head. We're dispensing headache tablets. I'm actually going to create it for, for the bedrooms. And we're putting a headache dispenser next to the bed. So when the woman say, and we don't want it where you turn it to get the tablet out, you just push the button, it jumps out. So when she says, oh, my, she, the husband says, there you are. Okay, all right. Move it right on, move it right on. Okay, we move on from distraction. Now look at Ephesians chapter 6. Now don't any of you go steal my ideas now, you know. And I want to put a, a hose pipe, uh, well, a thing, so she just has to go like that and suck the water and take the tablet. Okay, watch. Um, we take on the whole armor. Now watch this. Go down. Verse 16. Verse 16 says, Above all, taking the shield of faith, whereby you should be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Those are some of the darts we talked about. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Now, it goes back up and he says that we do not wrestle, verse 12 says, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against spiritual rules of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Now, he's telling us who our enemy is. Now, you could argue with your wife, you could argue with people, but a lot of the things, it's not the natural that is your enemy. Even if in your workplace, somebody is really uh, persecuting you, sometimes it is not the person that is the one you need to deal with. Sometimes you need to go into the realm of the spirit and deal with the spirit behind that person. Now, I want to show you what, why I'm telling you this, because I want you to wake up and recognize there, there is demonic activity going on in this nation even now. There are witches and warlocks and Satanists and Freemasons that are about their father's business, which is to bring death and destruction. And the, the, the Bible says Satan's come to steal, he's come to kill, and he's come to destroy. And his agents or his children are about their father's business. Do you know if you go to a coven, you know what a coven is? A coven is where witches meet. If you show up late for a coven, they strip you naked and beat you. So they all come up in time. Now, in church, we treat God as if God is an option. We don't seem to have the same respect and reverence for God. So we, we would come in here and instead of worshipping God, we will, do, we will just sit there and fold our arms not recognizing who, who God really is. Now, when God says that our, our war is not against flesh and blood... There are demonic spirits in this nation, in this area, that have come. There's one of the spirits that's entered this nation is a spirit of false religion. It has come into this nation big time. There was a time, believe it or not, 
when this nation shut down on Good Friday, on, on Easter Saturday, on Easter Sunday, and Easter Monday, every supermarket, every petrol station, everything, it was a ghost town. There was a time in this country where Christmas wasn't called Xmas. It wasn't called Happy Holidays. It was Christ Mass. It was a day when New Year's, uh, uh, not New Year's Eve, <coughs> Christmas Eve, all the petrol station were queues trying to fill up because over the next few days you couldn't get gasoline. Now, this country has been infiltrated and I believe the way it came is because of the money that the Muslim world holds in their hand. The Arab states, they hold vast wealth and they've come in, they've, they've bought petrol station, they've bought hotels in London, many of the hotels, Jeremiah Carlton, uh, the, the church, many of those hotels are owned by Arabic money, Muslim money. And the country has sold out to foreign religion for the sake of investments. And because of foreign investment, They've allowed false religions in, not realizing they think they're bringing money, but they're actually bringing destruction. But the Christian have got caught up in this, and we don't understand that if we don't learn to pray, it's not going to get better, it's going to get worse. So my prayer is not based on my feeling. My prayer is based on a revelation that, that we're dealing with principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness that if we don't deal with it, it's going to overtake us. And prayer is how we deal with it. You could, you, could, you could go around and petition, but it's when we learn to pray. Listen to me, do you, know, do you think there's every Monday that I feel like coming down here? Do you think it's every Monday? You sit at home, not this Monday, gone following Monday, I said to my wife, she said, I was on the floor, I like to put all my stuff on the floor and I study on the floor. And she says, she comes and she says to me, are you not going to church? I said, well, I'm studying. She said, well, study when you come home. And I said, well, you know, I'm just finishing up. She says, we need to go and pray. Now, you, you all don't have, not all of you have someone like that in your life. You lay on the floor and they say, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you, they say, what are you doing? You say, well, I'm studying. They say, oh, what are you studying? And they lie down on the floor with you. <laughs> and before you know it, none of you have prayed. So iron sharpeneth iron, so a man the countenance of his friend. And when you get around somebody that will not let you give up or quit, you need to hang on to that kind of person. Because some of you got friends that will, no matter if you say, I'm going raving, they'll say, well, what time? You need to have people around you that will push you and challenge you. This is what we do. This is what we do. When it's someone that challenges us, we shut them down. We put them away. When you come to church, you don't know what it is to be able to come in here and be challenged. I would rather come in here and be challenged than go to a church where they just tell me, well, you know, if you want a new Mercedes Benz, just sow your seed. And then go to hell with the, driving your Mercedes Benz. I want, to come, I want people that speak into my life. And you know when she says to me, we've got to go to church. You know what I did? I closed my Bible and I got up and I went to church and I come and pray. And guess what? I felt better. So do you understand who your enemy is? <coughs> when you go after your enemy like this, he will try to bring persecution. Here's where a lot of people get discouraged. If turn with me to Daniel. Chapter 10. Let me show you. In Daniel chapter 10, we see what happens in the spirit realm when people pray. How many prayed, still standing, still believing? How many prayed and not seen the answer yet? Believe in God for a car. Everyone else gets it before you. Believing for a husband, everyone gets married before you. You think to yourself, God, I'm so much better looking than her. <laughs> but she gets the best looking man in the church. Depends whose mirror you're looking in. Watch this. In the third year, you'll catch up soon, don't worry. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, 
a thing was revealed unto Daniel, whose name was called Belshazzar. And the thing was true, but the time appointed was long. Underline that word. The time appointed was long. Where most of us struggle is with the timing. Most Christians struggle with the timing. Our timing is not God's timing. We like to pray now and get the answer tomorrow, if not today. Now, he says the time was long. Sometimes we pray and we don't see the, the answer in a week or a month or a year. At that point, we become discouraged. Remember this statement. Because many of us pray for things we don't really want or we have no passion for. Pursuit is the evidence of desire. Say it with me. Say it again. Pursuit. If you don't desire it enough, he says, what things have you desire? Desire. Pursuit is the evidence of desire. What things have you desire? When you pray, believe you receive it and you shall have it. If you don't have the desire, you will never pray a prayer of faith. Pursuit is the evidence of desire. So when you're passionate about it, guess what? You'll pursue it. So when I pray, there's certain things I've prayed for, and even if I haven't seen it for a year or three years, because I'm passionate about it, I have the desire for it, even when I don't see it, I'm still holding on for it. Some of us pray for things we have no desire for, and after a year, it's like we don't remember what we prayed for. We used to do this when we're desperate for a car. Every car we see, we go to the car showroom. If the car was outside, we put our hands on it and claim it in Jesus' name. But then we see another car and we lay hands on that and claim that in Jesus' name. And when that didn't come, we see another car and we say, in Jesus' name, I claim that one. But we were just shooting in the dark. It was no passion. It was just desperation. And many of us pray like that. Daniel says the time was long. And he understood the thing and had understand the vision. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning for three full weeks. This was what we call a partial fast. Maybe we should do a partial fast. <coughs> um, a partial fast is we could just have soup for three weeks with no meat. Wow, just lost you. Great for dietary plan. This church can have, we could do a partial fast. Watch what he says. He said, in those days, I Daniel was fasting for three full weeks. I ate no pleasant bread. Watch this. This is the fast we're going to do. Can we agree on this? Let me give it a fast because I gave you Isaiah 58, right? I gave you Isaiah 58. Watch the fast. He says, I, he says, I've mourned for three full weeks, not 20 days, not 19 days. How many is three weeks? <clears throat> How many days in the week? Three sevens are? So 21 days, right? Here, here's the fast. I ate no pleasant bread, white bread, brown bread, toast, raisin bread, garlic bread, fruit bread, no bread, no bread. So number one, there's no bread. Secondly, it says, I ate no flesh, no meat. No bread, no meat. For three full weeks. This is a partial fast. And some of you think, I'd love to do a partial fast. Can we do a fruit fast? If you ever do a three-week fruit fast, you will curse grapes, you will curse fruit after three weeks. You will never buy grapes again for the rest of your life. Because at the beginning you think, oh, grapes, mmm. And then you know when you eat grapes but you can't eat meat? The grapes don't have the same effect. 
So here's the fast. It says, I ate no pleasant bread, neither came flesh and no wine in my mouth. So you could put your w- bottle away. <laughs> that, that, that white rum underneath your bed that you used to, to get to bed to sleep. He said, neither did I anoint myself at all. In other words, if you were a woman, he would say, I wore no makeup. <laughs> All right, let's let's skip let's skip the, let's skip that one, shall we? Let's skip let's skip the makeup, because we all have to come to the same church and see each other. <laughs> he says, "Now did I not myself." at all for three weeks until the three weeks were fulfilled watch this now he prayed the first day he prayed <clears throat> see what we do is we pray without thinking about the spiritual realm we, we, are, we are so earthly minded that we forget the war that we're in <clears throat> the war we're in is with to these eyes invisible beings but yet they're very powerful beings you know, people say, the devil's so weak. Well, if he's weak, he is, uh, I'd hate to see him strong because he's taken out a lot of people. You know, one of, the, one of his fiery darts, <laughs> offense, and you're gone. I've seen so many people, <clears throat> offense. And do you know, did you know that we all know when you're offended? Did you know that? It's like BO. Everyone knows you have it except you. Here's your language. You know, body language says a lot. The offended person always moves backwards. You watch. When you're offended, you move two rows back, three rows back, four rows back, to the back of the church and through the door. Is that right or am I wrong? Offended people always do the same thing. So he says, after three weeks, he says, and the fourth and twentieth day of the month, I was by the side of the great river, which is is Hidekel. Then I lifted up mine eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen, whose loins were girded with fine gold of Upaz. His body also was like the beryl, and his face as the appearance of lightning, and his eyes as lamps of fire, and his arms and his feet like in color to polished brass, and the voice of his words like the voice of a multitude." And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision, for the men that were with me saw not the vision. But a great quaking fell upon them, so that they fled to to hide themselves. Therefore I was left alone, and saw this great vision, and there remained in me no strength. For my comeliness was turned turned me into corruption, and I retained no strength. Yet I heard the voice of his words, And when I heard the voice of his words, then was I in a deep sleep on my face and my face toward the ground. And behold, a hand touched me, which set me upon my knees and upon the palms of my hand. He's on all fours. And he said unto me, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved. This is what happens to someone who God really loves. Could you imagine someone who he doesn't really, he's not fond of, what would happen to them? Huh? Imagine someone living in sin. He says, Oh Daniel, a man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak unto you. Stand upright, for unto thee am I now sent. When he had spoken this word unto me, I stood trembling. Then said he unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day, what day? <laughs> Hebrews 11.1 1 says what? Can you shout it out? Hebrews 11 one says what? Now faith is. Forget the rest. Faith is always, <clears throat> faith is never going to be tomorrow. If you say one day, then it's not faith. That's what we call hope. Faith is always now. From the moment I prayed, God heard my prayer. And this is what we've got to understand. 
when you're praying for somebody, you see, I spoke to King today, and when you speak to him, I don't know if you've been calling him, he's a really strong person now. He's eating. I mean, he's eating down. His wife now is getting concerned because he won't stop eating. He says, you know, he says to me, Pastor, I just had dinner, and two hours later, I'm asking for another plate because I'm so hungry. I'm just eating everything in sight. I said to him, get yourself some Mars bars and eat those and you'll bump up really quick. And just remember to stop. Don't develop the sweet tooth for it. But he says now, things are, it's like he's growing, his body's getting back to what it should be. But do you remember the time when you saw him in here? Do you remember the days when it looked like he wouldn't make it? But he kept saying, but I trust God. I, I trust God. But you see, it, what it looks like does not mean that's what God says it should be. So when you pray, many times it looks worse before it gets better. You start praying for your, your unsaved loved one, and they become like wild. It's like the moment you pray, they begin to get wild. They want to go raving. They want to go out with the wrong people. They're hanging out with the wrong crowd. It's like, oh my God, I'm praying for you. Sometimes, you understand how it works. When you pray, the devil retaliates, try to block it, and what it looks like, if you, if you say, well, I guess it didn't work, you've lost the battle. Daniel prayed, he says, oh, Daniel, man greatly beloved of God. From the first day you prayed, I've come because of your prayer. But then he says, in, I was on my way, but the prince of Persia hindered me. In other words, there was a war in the heavens. And how I many know a natural prince could not fight? You just read what the angel looked like, right? You read what happened to Daniel when he just, it wasn't, he saw a vision. You saw how the natural man trembled and fell apart at the vision. So it wasn't the prince of Persia, whether it, was be, it would be the queen of England, the president of America, if they ever encountered this man, this, this angelic being, they too will be like, their comeliness will become nothing in them. They too will fall on their face. So this prince of Persia that withstood the angel is not a natural man. So in the spirit realm, there's this attack trying to hinder the angel bringing the answer to Daniel. <clears throat> but what did Daniel do? Daniel fasted the partial fast. Daniel, in the, when he began to pray and he began to fast, he began to strengthen the angels and the weapons of the, uh, the enemy began to fall apart and come to nothing. And that's what happens when Christians pray. Even more now. When we pray in the name of Jesus, Satan has to flee. When we come against every... You could have been saved a week. If you know who you are and you begin to take authority, let me tell you, you don't, don't just pray one time. Some things you have to break through in. When you pray for an unsaved loved one, it is a war. The, the Bible talks about groaning in the spirit. The Bible talks in, in Romans 8, 26. He says the, the Spirit of God helps our infirmities. He helps us to pray and we pray the perfect will of God. Some things you have to give birth to. Have you ever seen a woman giving birth? Has any woman in here ever given birth? It's called travail. You begin to travail. Ah! You scream. You birth in something. And sometimes when you pray, and some of you have never been to this level because you don't pray long enough. You just thank you, Jesus, bless me, and amen, and, uh, bless me, Lord. But there's, there's a place where it goes beyond, thank you, Jesus, thank you, Jesus, thank you, Jesus. There's a place where it goes beyond, shandaramamarobobose. There's a place where you go in, out of this world, into the next world. There's a place where you begin to war and contend in the spirit realm. And you begin to go into travail where you birth things in the spirit realm. And you do that and you find is this freedom, this liberty. And you know that you know that you know. I don't care. It's, it's done. If you've never done that, I pray that you, God will give you that. Can you say amen? 21 days. 21 days. I don't have enough time, but Mark chapter 9 tells you this, that there are certain types of spirit that will not go out except through fasting and prayer. And we read again in, in um, Hezekiah, I think my wife read it on Sunday, in 2 Kings 20, 
when Hezekiah, the man of God, told Hezekiah, Hezekiah, get your house in order. Get your house in order. For the Lord said, you shall surely die. You're going to die. Now, every time I read that, when I'm by myself, I read that. I always ask myself the same question. Every time I read it, here's what I ask myself. What would have been the outcome if Hezekiah, Hezekiah said, thank you very much. Wife, come. God bless you. Children, come. God bless you. And just laid there. What would happen to Hezekiah? What happened to him? Now, I wonder how many of us accept. So I said to King and everybody else, when a doctor tells you you're, never, you're not going to live, don't cuss the doctor out. Just bind him and cast him down. Because he's, that's according to his knowledge. So I never accept a doctor's report because I recognize the doctor is limited in his knowledge and his ability. So when a doctor says you only have so much time or you've got this or you've got that, I say thank you very much. Now Jesus, this is what you said. And you go back and you begin to pray. Are you listening to me? I'm praying for you that you will catch the spirit of prayer. And I'm praying that this church will go to another level of prayer rather than just shandala baba, shandala baba, shandala baba. High tie, mo tie, bow tie, we tie, we love each other. We, I'm praying that we will go to a deeper, deeper place in God where we are, you know, we are not just waiting for the church to say fast, but we will fast. Some of you didn't even fast today. Are you hearing me? I, I, I would be a fool if I could even imagine everybody in this room fasting from 9 till 5 today. At 4.32, my wife says, I've done, this, I've done soup. She did some soup today. And she says, you ready? I said, no, no, look at the time. It's not 5 o'clock yet. And you know, we wouldn't touch it until 5 o'clock. Was I hungry? Yes. Did I want something to eat? Of course. Didn't you all? Didn't you all? And I, when, when it was about 10 past 5, sometimes you have to do it on purpose. Don't stand over the pot with the... <laughs> And you time it. It's going to take me three seconds to put the, put the spoon in the food. All right. Four, 4.49 and 55 seconds. See, that, that's not fasting. That, that you, you're loving it too much. <laughs> Somewhere in June, this church is going to do a three-week fast. This church is going to do a partial fast where we'll eat no meat, we'll eat no bread, nothing pleasant. Hmm? But the thing is, there's so much food available now, I don't know how we're going to do it because some of you will supplement it. Some of you will find, you know, you'll say, well, spam rightfully isn't meat. And corned beef isn't meat. Did pastor mean meat as in beef, chicken, lamb? Because corned beef is not really beef anymore because it's processed now. No, we're going to say no fish, no meat, no burgers. Sorry? Her wedding? You're fasting all through your wedding, darling. <laughs> no, no, we won't do it around Sam's wedding. We'll wait before or after Sam's wedding and we'll do it so Sam can have her wedding. Would you stand to your feet with me today? I want those of you, listen to me, I'm really, now, now I'm serious. I want those of you that are struggling with prayer to come and stand here. Well, I want to pray for you. If you're one of those struggling, <coughs> listen to me, prayer is a discipline. Do you get it? Prayer is a discipline. This morning, I woke up at 5.30. I went into my bathroom. And the first thing I do, I turn the clock away from me so I'm not putting God on the clock. I turn the clock away. I don't have any watches or any timepiece with me. And what I do, I pray until I'm fulfilled. 
And I don't think about the time because I think more about what, the, what my prayer is achieving. And if you get to do this, it is a discipline. There is no, you know, like Jesus' disciple says, Luke chapter 11, he said, Lord, teach us to pray. I expect every one of you to be in prayer meeting on a Monday night. Because, you, you know, us praying here is not going to change it. You've got to do something. I'll pray for you now and you'll find, you'll find a surge, but it's maintaining it. You know, you go up and you come down, you go up, you come. It is getting to that place where I can maintain this thing. It's a discipline. You must set up a routine where you read your Bible every day. Every day. I put the time some side and I read every day. That means I, whether I like it or not, whether I feel like it or not, I'm going to read. And you can't read and not pray. You can't pray and not read. They go hand in hand like this. If you do one without the other, you're going to lose it. You've got to do both together, and that's what's going to fuel the passion in you. Amen?